Hey, Bridgetown family, our annual Holy Spirit Conference is coming up at the end of this month. We're so expectant for what God's gonna do during this sacred time. And there's still time to register to join us in person for just $100. You can do that at holyspiritco.me. And if you're not able to join us in person, you can join us via live stream for just 25 bucks. The live stream, of course, would allow you access to all of our sessions uh, live, but you could also watch them subsequently after the fact uh, if that is more helpful to you. However you're able to, we really hope that you'll join us. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to the latest Forbes research, 62% of Americans made New Year's resolutions this year. The most common resolutions by category were 48% of people made physical fitness goals, 38% it was about improving finances, for 36% improve mental health, and then 34% losing weight, and 32% improving diet. Obviously, People could select more than one of these, and you can see the overlap in some of the selections. But what I found most revealing about their research was that 80% of respondents felt confident about reaching their goals. But only 20% of respondents had any plan for accountability or follow-through to help them reach those goals. Now, based on planning that airtight, you can guess where this is headed. 8% of New Year's resolutions don't make it through January, another 22% drop off in February, and another 22% after that in March. So, more than half of New Year's resolutions don't make it through the first quarter of the year. In fact, Forbes found that only 6% of New Year's resolutions actually make it to year end. So, 74% of those very confidently unaccountable people are scratching their heads at the end of the year wondering what went wrong. But even that 6% figure is misleading because it defines success all wrong. Everyone sets a New Year's resolution not aimed at accomplishing the practice, but at experiencing the fruit that I believe this practice offers. I commit to a plant-based diet because I want to feel more energetic or to cold plunging because Wim Hof told me that it would increase my circulation and help with my metabolism or to read more books because I think that's going to be a more rewarding way of unwinding than watching television. The point is not to get to the year end having ground your way through the vegan diet or read 12 novels, but to feel the way that a body powered by brown rice and avocados is supposed to feel or to think the way a well-read person is supposed to think. Now let me make this a little bit more personal. In the last year, I dealt with more physical health problems than any other year in my life, and it is not close. And as a year that included plenty of sickness, limitation, and hours spent in the offices of doctors and surgeons and specialists drew to a close, almost like a cherry on top of 2023 in late December, apologies for the overshare here, I was diagnosed with a pretty advanced case of shingles. Now, shingles, if you're not aware, is a horribly painful outbreak of sores on the skin, and it is caused almost exclusively by high levels of stress. And that diagnosis was a moment of very unwelcome clarity for me, because around that time, if you had have have asked, hey, Tyler, are you feeling particularly stressed right now? I would have said, no, feeling great. Thanks for asking. A moment of unwelcome clarity summarized in the realization, if the body keeps the score, I'm losing. But here's the thing. I practice solitude, meaning silent prayer aimed at slowing down my mind, body, and soul to live attentively to Jesus. I practice solitude 10 minutes every single day and for an hour on Fridays. 
and I practice Sabbath for 24 hours once a week with my family and my community. I take quarterly 48-hour silent retreats, all of which are spiritual practices aimed at slowing me down and keeping me living at the pace of Jesus. I'm checking all of the boxes, but success isn't checking the boxes. It's not accomplishing the practices. It's experiencing the life that those practices are meant to cultivate in my inner being, a life of inner slowness and stillness. And that diagnosis was a very unwelcome moment of clarity. I'm doing the practices. Why isn't it working? Hold that thought. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the famous line. It's one of those standout sayings of Jesus that's made its way beyond the walls of the church and into poetry and song, one of those lines that plenty of people have heard, even if they don't know its origins. There's a puzzle, though, in these famous words that has been turning over in my imagination like a Rubik's Cube for months now. And if you're working on a puzzle, how do you start? You don't just take one puzzle piece out of the box and look at the image and think about where it might fit. You dump all the pieces out on the table and you turn them right side up and you find the corners first if you know what you're doing. (laughs) So if we're going to solve a puzzle, we got to start by acknowledging the pieces. Piece one, for my yoke is easy. Now we rarely think of Jesus this way, but he was a rabbi, a Bible teacher. And a rabbi was a Jewish spiritual leader with disciples. Most people hear a word like disciple and they immediately think of religion, but discipleship was not first a Christian idea. While, of course, the master-apprentice concept is really widespread in its origins, the origins of the word disciple came from Greek philosophy, not from the Jewish temple. Jewish rabbis were borrowing this concept from Socrates and Plato. And disciple directly means follower or apprentice. It's someone who is emulating the life of a mentor, their skills and their personal habits and their priorities the whole lot. It's It's a person who is learning a trade, like construction. Now, I'm so inept at any form of craftsmanship that I had to hire Jordan and Joseph Russell to put together the foosball table that I got for my children for Christmas while I distracted them outside. What is standing between me and successful craftsmanship? It's not beginning to read Ikea manuals as I doze off to sleep every night. I got to get a wrench and a hammer in my hand and begin to get my hands dirty. I need to apprentice under a general contractor who can show me the way, and that's discipleship. It is to learn the life of a rabbi by both intellectual understanding and embodied practice. Now, by the time Jesus showed up, discipleship was very common in ancient Israel. There were rabbis like Hillel and Gamaliel who were well-known and highly sought after, but every single rabbi had disciples following them, emulating both, or I'm sorry, learning their teaching, but also emulating their lifestyle and practice. Every rabbi had a yoke which is a shorthand way of saying this particular rabbi's teaching, knowledge, intellectual understanding, and this particular rabbi's practice, meaning the embodied practices that convert that knowledge into life. Next piece of the puzzle. Of everyone around at the time of Jesus, it was the Pharisees who most obviously seemed to be wearing his yoke. I mean, like Jesus, the Pharisees had beliefs that were firmly rooted in Yahweh and the Hebrew Scriptures. And like Jesus, the Pharisees lived by a distinct set of practices designed to help them embody those teachings in their everyday life. So the Pharisees are simultaneously the people whose lives, at least externally, most match Jesus' own, and they are the recipients of Jesus' harshest criticism. What's the deal with that? Well, the thing about Jesus' famous lines is that we tend to pull them out of the story that they're written in and hold them like nuggets of wisdom that, that stand all on their own. But if we read these famous words of Jesus within the plot of the story that Matthew is writing, something interesting emerges. Just continue reading the story, picking up exactly where we left off at that famous line, and you'll see what I mean. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. The Pharisees go on from here to criticize Jesus' disciples for snacking on a bit of grain on a slow Sabbath stroll through this field, and then to criticize Jesus for miraculously healing a man in the synagogue on a day when, by their narrow understanding, he was meant to be resting, not healing. 
Jesus' point in response to all this is something like, you are following the rules of Sabbath to perfection, but it's all making you less restful, peaceful, and loving, not more. Sabbath is making you controlling, anal, and off-putting to the very people that are most in need of rest. So according to Jesus, there's a way to go about spiritual formation that dots every I, crosses every T, and seems to be lived with pinpoint accuracy and yet misses the mark entirely. Like a New Year's resolution that you successfully practice but never experience the life that that practice was aimed at in the first place or like a disciplined rhythm of solitude that you think is curbing you in a slow, attentive way until you realize suddenly and painfully that you are keeping the practices but you're far from the life. The earliest communities of Jesus' followers were called followers of the way, meaning they so embodied the narrow way of Jesus' lifestyle that they were uh, identified by it in the surrounding world. Jesus' modern followers are far from the ancients. The church of our time has become infamous for being a people of alternative beliefs, but a nearly indistinguishable lifestyle from the surrounding world. And sure, maybe in the very worst cases, that's because of an intentionally ego-driven spirituality, but the vast majority of the time, it's just really good, sincere people trying to follow Jesus in the complexity of their everyday lives, but living with a mysterious gap uh, between my best intention and my actual day-to-day -day life. In his latest and I personally think best book, author David Brooks confesses that when he wrote the book The Road to Character just a few years ago, which is uh, all about living your life for other people, he spent the weeks right after that book's publication obsessively checking his Amazon rankings. So there it is. The gap that we all know too well between what we believe and how we really mean to live and the day-to-day -day life that we're actually living. And most of us are a whole lot less sinister hypocrite and a whole lot more David Brooks really believing that the best and right way to live is for the sake of others and yet obsessively checking on the approval of others to form my own sense of self. I'm checking all the boxes, I'm keeping the practices, I understand the concepts. Why isn't it working? Happy New Year, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Today we're beginning a new teaching series. It's going to cover the nine core practices that make up the easy yoke of Jesus. It's going to take us all the way to Easter Sunday, but right from the beginning, I want to direct your attention beyond what are the practices or even how do I do the practices to what are the practices supposed to do to me? The big question for today isn't so much how do I wear the easy yoke of Jesus or what are the correct practices that make up the easy yoke of Jesus. It is how does practicing the way of Jesus actually lighten my burden and rest my soul? And to get at that puzzling question, I want to look deeper into this familiar passage through three simple questions, what, why, and how. So first, what is Jesus' invitation? Let's look back together at Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Look along with me in your Bibles. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Charles Spurgeon points out that there's only one place in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's 89 chapters of the Bible, and yet there's only one place where Jesus tells us about his heart. There's one place where he explicitly says, here's what my inner life is like. Here is the beat of my heart. It is gentle and humble. Does that description surprise you? I mean, if you had to summarize the heart of God in just two words, would you choose these two? Or might you go with something different? Mighty and powerful, resilient and determined, healing and forgiving, cold and distant. Jesus says, here is the beat of my heart. It is gentle and humble. And to borrow a bit of research from pastor and author Dana Ortland, the ancient Greek word here translated as gentle is one that Jesus uses only two other times in the whole of the four Gospels. One is in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, blessed are the meek, or gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And the second was in his uh, final entrance into Jerusalem. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle. And riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, I am gentle, Jesus says. I'm not demanding, not reactionary, not impatient or easily angered. 
My temperament is a whole lot more like an old man playing chess in the park than it is a CEO occupying a high rise that, that puts a shadow over top of that park. My natural state, my home base, the way that I roll out of bed each morning is relaxed, listening, easy to be around. I've got a whole lot more going on than any CEO ever will, and yet my presence is easier, my spirit gentler, my gaze kinder. So come, sit. I've got time for you. The posture most natural to him, writes Ortland, is not a pointed finger, but open arms. I am gentle and... Humble. This is the same ancient Greek word that we read elsewhere in the New Testament to refer to the lower class or the poor. Luke chapter 1, he has brought down rulers from their thrones but has lifted up the humble, which is also translated those of low estate. Or Romans 12, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. This is the same word for humble. Jesus is telling us that he is a person without status, that socially he's unimpressive. He's not the center of attention. He's not commanding the room. If you were to walk into a party and Jesus was there, you'd likely find an empty seat next to him. You wouldn't find it hard to get his attention. If you walked into a church service on a Sunday, you probably wouldn't find Jesus on the front row surrounded by a cluster of his friends that you couldn't break into or with a pop star microphone dangling from his ear. He would probably be mostly in the back, easy to overlook, and easy to approach. The way that Jesus uses this word humble is the same way that we use the English word approachable. He's not intimidating. He somehow held on to a stunning heavenly power, but he's holding it in a humble way that you can't help but be drawn to him and find him inviting, disarming, approachable. And the result of getting near to the heart of Jesus is, back to verse 29, and you will find rest for your souls. Rest for your soul. That's the result of getting close to Jesus. But that sounds almost too spiritual. So let's try this. Relax. The goal of discipleship to Jesus is to relax. New Testament scholar Frederick Dale Bruner says that the Apostle John repeatedly uses this difficult to translate ancient Greek word in his gospel. We almost always bring it into English in our modern translation as believe or trust, but he argues that the very best translation of the word is relax. Try reading John's gospel and substitute relax everywhere you come across believe or trust. John chapter 6, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The work of God is this, to relax into Jesus. All of his teaching, his mission, his discipleship ends here. You and I, in the chaos, need, and frenzy of this world, relaxed in relationship to him. And I find it so fitting that as John, of all the gospel authors, who emphasizes this theme most, because when Jesus had repeatedly predicted his own death and he was living with a bounty on his head but still insisted that he was going to Jerusalem and even after breaking bread and comparing it to what was about to happen to his body and pouring wine and saying the same about his blood, in the midst of all of that disorientation and legit cause for worry, where do we find John at the Last Supper? Laying his head on Jesus' chest. Literally relaxing into Jesus, hearing his gentle and humble heartbeat against uh, his ear. Come to me with your burdens, and I'll trade you, Jesus says. I'll give you mine. My burden is light. It is rest, relaxation for the very deepest part of you. It sounds good, doesn't it? All right, then. Why isn't it working? (laughs) Why, if it's Jesus I'm following, does my burden feel heavy and my soul feel more anxious or just tired than it does rested? Why do circumstances seem to have a more powerful say on my soul's health than my beliefs do? And why does transformation seem unable to touch my anger problem or my pornography problem or my judgment problem or my gossip problem? Why does my family of origin and my personality type and that one little fragment of my identity seem to have a more defining say on my own formation than the Savior of the world does? And why doesn't a set of solitude practices seem to be affecting the way that I'm carrying stress and the way that it shows up in my body. Why isn't it working? That's an honest question, not a cynical one. 
And it's one that doesn't have one simple answer, but instead is the result of a combination of factors, of historical, experiential, and relational factors that we'll address one at a time. Why isn't it working? First, a historical reason. A 2015 study by the Barner Research Group on the state of discipleship in the modern church concluded that, generally speaking, there's an assumption that the appropriation of biblical knowledge will by itself lead to spiritual maturity. Now, of course, biblical knowledge is very important, but it also doesn't lead to maturity all on its own. There's likely a face or two in your memory who have made that unattractively apparent to you. So why not? Because Jesus doesn't only invite us to believe his teachings, he invites us to wear his yoke, which includes both intellectual belief in the truth that he is teaching and embodied practice, remember? We are whole embodied people, we're not just brains on a stick. All formation requires knowledge that is converted into practice. Discovering that I'm gluten intolerant does not immediately lead to me feeling differently. I must convert that knowledge into different habits in my diet in order to Uh, have a change in the way that I feel. The belief that getting more sleep at night will lead to more satisfying days does not change the way that I'm living my days if I'm still staring at the glow of a screen late tonight. Belief must be converted into practice to reach its formational potential. And some beliefs are more more powerful than others, but all beliefs, including our spiritual beliefs, must be converted into practice if they're going to form us. So if this idea, which is so pervasive in the church today, did not come from Jesus, where did it come from? According to psychologist Todd Hall, until the 13th century, spirituality and theology were not used as distinct terms. Today, spirituality is a term often used to describe the more experiential aspects of relationship to God, and theology is a term used to refer to uh, the ideas about God or the academic pursuit of God. But according to Hall, for 13 years of church history, a separation like that was entirely unthinkable. To know about God was to know God, and the pursuit of God was inseparably the pursuit of God understood academically and the pursuit of God experienced relationally and bodily. That was not just the common, it was essentially the only way of thinking about spiritual maturity until the 16th and 17th century Enlightenment, when the embodied practices of Jesus declined significantly in the global church as scientific objectivism and rationalism rose. In other words, a split then emerged between spirituality and theology that did not exist for the first 1,300 years worth of Jesus' followers, making it not only possible but common to divorce the truth of Jesus from the way of Jesus, assuming there's a way to get at Jesus' life without actually wearing Jesus' yoke. The dominant metaphor used in the Gospel of John for Jesus' invitation is life. But many of us, when we first heard the invitation of Jesus, it sounded more like, if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you'll receive his grace and you'll go to heaven when you die. Which is beautiful and true, but also it's incomplete. The obvious oversight in this sort of explanation of Jesus' invitation is life. Like your entire life. Which I'd argue is a pretty significant oversight. Jesus is not only teaching us how to die, Even more so, he's teaching us how to live. Now, salvation is the technical one-word summary for the life that Jesus offers to you and me. And salvation is biblically presented to us as a past, present, and future reality. Salvation is something that has happened. Christ has already paid our debt. And salvation is happening. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And it's something that will happen to those who believe. Christ will return to make our salvation full and final and complete. Salvation is about what Jesus has done for us. And it's about what Jesus is doing and will do for us. However, in recent church history, salvation has often been described purely as a past work of Jesus, ignoring the present and the future. Uh, The life of Jesus is not about what you do for God. It's about what God has done, past tense, for you. And you receive his life Not by what you do, but by believing in his truth. Yes, that's absolutely true. And it's incomplete. Because it minimizes a salvation life into a salvation moment. 
And many people, myself included, can trace their decision to follow Jesus back to a divine moment, like that sacred moment when the disciples dropped their nets and went after him. But of course, that moment was the beginning of a new life. Other people can't trace back their decision to follow Jesus to a particular moment, but instead realized it in hindsight. Like I was exploring this rabbi named Jesus, and somewhere along the way I looked up and realized, I'm not sure exactly when and where, but I've accepted him as Savior and Lord. But when we overemphasize a salvation moment, the unintended consequence is that we can create the possibility of receiving Jesus' life without becoming Jesus' disciple. And that's a possibility that is very difficult to square with the biblical story. It's one that turns transformation into nothing more than a transaction and minimizes the full, expansive invitation of Jesus into just a portion of that invitation. In the words of Dallas Willard, salvation as conceived of today is far removed from what it was in the beginnings of Christianity and only by correcting it can God's grace in salvation be returned to the concrete, embodied existence of our human personalities walking with Jesus in his easy yoke. Now don't misunderstand me here. Salvation is by grace alone through Jesus. It is about the forgiveness of sin and it is a gift, not an achievement. And salvation is rebirth into the fullest kind of life. A life that we work out with fear and trembling and a life that we will know completely at his return. Salvation is like a seed planted into the soul of a human being. And like a seed, it is one that grows and grows into increasingly multiplying life. And like a seed, it must be cultivated and tended if it's to reach its full potential. Which means, among other things, that the way of Jesus, by his own admission, does require effort. In fact, a yoke was a tool laid onto the back of an animal for the sake of labor. To take on a rabbi's yoke was to willingly wear their life and teaching for the sake of active labor. The unique thing about Jesus among other rabbis was not that his yoke requires no effort, it's that the yoke of Jesus works in this entirely upside down way, where the longer you wear it on your shoulders, the lighter you seem to become. And where the longer that you labor with him, the more at rest you seem to become. Rick Rubin is one of the music industry's most decorated producers. He gave us the sound of the Beastie Boys, of Tom Petty, Weezer, Jay-Z, Willie Nelson, and who could forget, Sir Mix-a-Lot. <laughs> In the last year, he also gave us the really insight- insightful book, The Creative Act collecting all the insights he'd gained, working with all these different artists over the year. And there's a chapter within that book where he talks about committed ritual and practice. And he concludes, discipline and freedom seem like opposites. In reality, they are partners. And that's a whole lot like what Jesus is telling us about his yoke. It requires effort and cultivation, but that discipline does not imprison me. It frees me. In her memoir, Sumon Kidd puts it this way, religion is not to be believed, but danced. And she goes on to describe the yoke of Jesus not only as the endless pursuit of biblical insight, but as a living knowledge, a way of of converting insight into embodied practice, much like we learn the steps of a dance. Jesus' yoke is unique because where other rabbis were appealing to their disciples' sense of duty, Jesus appeals to our sense of desire. His challenge sounds something like, can you bear to believe that what you want deepest is not a desire to defer in the name of realism, but a desire to awaken in the name of hope? And can you bring me that hope, trusting that I can show you a way to convert your life if you'll follow after me into a life that fans that hope more and more into a flame until you're living in its reality? Let's bring this a little bit closer from a history lesson into an experiential acknowledgement. The Old Testament tabernacle given to Israel by God all the way back in Exodus, it had plenty of regulations like cleansings and offerings and sacrifices and special days, but of course, the Old Testament tabernacle wasn't about any of those things. It was about formation for life with God. And that's what spiritual formation has always been about, from the Exodus tabernacle to Jesus and all the way through church history. It's been to form people for life with God, a God who's gentle and humble in heart, a God who welcomes the heavily burdened, a God who promises rest for our souls. 
But the ancient tabernacle shows us the human propensity to confuse the end with the means, to elevate the how of spiritual formation above the why of spiritual formation. So after a heart-rending invitation to come and wear his easy yoke, Jesus finds himself immediately walking through a grain field on a leisurely Sabbath stroll, and his disciples are having a snack or two as they go. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. A few verses later, the priest posed this question a second time, again sounding a whole lot more like an accusation than it is a question. Verse 9 Going from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus is standing with a group of priests in front of a man who needs healing under the roof of their own synagogue, a man who Jesus will go on to heal while they go on missing the forest for the trees. You see, Jesus' life was a light that was exposing them. You are following the rules and you are keeping the practices to perfection, but the way that you are practicing is deforming you, not forming you. Hold on, do not miss this. There is a way of pursuing spiritual formation that leads to deformation. What is it? The Pharisees elevated the how of spiritual formation over the why of spiritual formation. And the question at the heart of Jesus is not what are the practices or how do I do the practices, it's what are the practices doing to me? Why serve the poor? What is the Jesus practice of service supposed to be doing to me? Well, it's among the poor that we see God. Jesus promises that his presence can be predictably found among our neediest neighbors. We often think that we go to serve the poor so that we can imitate the compassion of Jesus, and that is the how of service. It's how we're meant to serve, but it's not the why. When you go under the bridge and serve at night strike and find yourself laying a plate of food, a styrofoam plate, down on a linoleum table and ask if this brother or sister needs a drink as well, and then go back to get that from them, you are meant to recall the promise of Jesus in Luke 12 that at my return, you will sit down at a table and I will put on the apron and I will come to wait on you. You see, we serve because it is in service to our neediest neighbors that we can encounter experientially the very things Jesus has promised us in a way that is difficult to encounter if we insulate ourselves from the lives of those very neighbors. Or or when you find yourself on your hands and knees washing the feet of someone who probably hasn't had their feet washed since this time last week on a cold, wet winter night, you're serving there so that you can remember that it's Jesus who promises to wash your feet, even on the very night of your betrayal, that this is the way that he relates to you. And when you encounter that experientially in that moment, it has a way of making its way deeper into you than it does when you're just reflecting on it alone in a prayer closet. You see, this is why we serve, because service is the place of encounter with Jesus, who reforms me from the inside out. That's what service is supposed to do to me. Why do we practice Sabbath? I mean, you're in a workplace full of demands, and you've got a home full of obligations, and you live in a city full of distractions. So why on earth would you set aside 24 hours once a week purely to rest? Hopefully so that I can become a person of inner rest, tuning my life to eternity in a way that sets both my anxieties and my ambitions in their proper perspective. And because I see the limits of my practice, my own inability to plan and execute my soul level rest uh, shows me that what I really want deepest and what I really long for most, I cannot just life hack into my routine, but I must receive from the God who is gracious to give. Why do I practice solitude? Why on earth set aside time just to be silent? Because the noise of this world grows attachment to lesser lovers that then break the hearts of their worshipers. And without silence, I overattach myself to productivity or to accomplishment or to control. And solitude retunes my wandering heart to peace in a world of competition and hurry and anxiety. And again, this is not a life hack that Jesus offers us or a clever New Year's resolution that we can take on. Good practice partners with God's transformation within me and the limits of my attempts at practice partner with God's transformation within me. Because it's when I see that all my attempts at solitude are not producing the soul level rest that I believe that I really need and want to receive 
from God that I peel my hands open and I say, God, I cannot plan and execute my way to transformation. Would you come and do within me what I cannot do for myself? To know the fruit of the practices, we've got to keep our eyes fixed on the why of the practices, what, what they're supposed to do to us. And all spiritual practice is aimed at a very familiar threefold end, to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. But two very common conditions do crop up in the lives of us, or in our lives when we confuse the how with the why. And they go by the name of entitlement and shame. There's entitlement, meaning God owes me a particular return on this investment. Entitlement is an attempt to snatch from God what he is eagerly desiring to give to me. God wants to give me peace, healing, and wholeness as a free gift. But when I think God owes me those things, I misunderstand the nature of the giver and miss out on the gift. When it's entitlement that's coloring our imaginations, we turn God into a system like an exercise plan rather than a relationship like a friendship or a marriage. And modern people like us, we've got the tendency to turn everything into a wellness plan, right? I'm going paleo, I'm into uh, adaptogen mushroom supplements now, I do yoga at home every morning, oh, and I've started practicing the way of Jesus. But discipleship, of course, is relational, not systematic. It is participation in a mysterious communal love that exists between Father, Son, and Spirit, and relationships are endlessly more gratifying than systems ever could be, but relationships are a whole lot less predictable than systems are too. The underlying condition of entitlement is that we depersonalize God, and that is not the God that we uh, receive and is revealed in Jesus. On the other side of that coin, though, is shame. And shame says something like, my spiritual formation's up to me, so if I'm behind where I think I should be, then it's my fault. You know, regardless of spiritual maturity or years under our belts following Jesus, it's my pastoral experience that almost everyone carry some area of their lives that they insist on trying to sort out all on their own. Some past wound, some ongoing struggle, some piece of our identity. The result of which is that we relate to God always like there's an elephant in the room, like there's this one subject of our lives that we've both agreed not to talk about, but it is looming large in our peripheral at all times. And then shame attaches itself differently to different personality types. For the perfectionist, shame becomes scrupulosity where I'm fine-tuning my life and doing everything I can to perfect and execute my plan. For the achiever, shame becomes some form of penance where I'm trying to earn back from God what I think I owe him rather than receive his forgiveness by grace. For the security seeker, we run to other people to try to get the approval and acceptance that we're meant to get from God. All of this is shame expressing itself differently through unique people. When Jesus is saying, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Who is it that can approach Jesus? The weary and burdened. We obsessively assume that we unburden ourselves in order to approach God, that we put our best foot forward. But according to Jesus, your burden is your qualification. It's what gets you in the door with him. The French priest, Father Jacques Philippe, writes this. Let us understand this, for the person of goodwill, meaning for the imperfect but sincere follower of Jesus, that which, is a, that which is serious in sin is not so much the fault in itself as the despondency into which it places him. He who falls but immediately gets up has not, has not lost much. He has rather gained in humility and in the experience of mercy. He who remains sad and defeated loses much more. The sign of spiritual progress is not so much never falling as it is being able to lift oneself up quickly after one falls. Spiritual maturity defined by this priest is not never stumbling, it's learning to pop back up quicker and quicker after you and I inevitably stumble. For the perfect but sincere follower of Jesus, Satan's greatest trick and his real temptation is to get you to wallow on the ground defining yourself by your most recent failure when God continues to define you by his grace. You see, both entitlement and shame, they are upended by this one really simple realization that spiritual maturity is fundamentally relational. And that's the last piece to this puzzle. Meaning that spiritual maturity involves the way that I relate to God, to myself, and to other people. 
So spiritual maturity is how I relate to God, and that happens through both belief and practice. We've pretty well covered that part already. But spiritual maturity is also the way that I relate to myself, because the salvation life of Jesus is a seed that is planted in the midst of an existing and unique human story. And that means spiritual maturity is going to intersect with other shaping factors within each and every person. Factors like your family of origin and your personality structure and your attachment patterns. You have been uniquely shaped and uniquely misshapen by the home that you were born into and the love that you did and did not experience there. You've been uniquely shaped by the personality structure that you relate to the world through and the strengths and weaknesses that come along with that. You've been uniquely shaped by the trust structure that you developed as a child and the way that that informs your emotional and relational availability to other people even today. The spiritual life is a shared journey where every last one of us drops our nets and follows after Jesus of Nazareth, the same rabbi, and the spiritual life is a unique journey where the victories and obstacles for each one of us along the way are going to be as unique as human beings are. So this is about the way we relate to God, the way we relate to ourselves, and lastly, the way that we relate to others. Because the way of Jesus does not culminate in a perfect work-life balance. It culminates in taking up your cross and sacrificial love for others. It's about losing your life and in that act, finding it. The issue that Jesus pointed out in the formation of the Pharisees wasn't that they weren't taking the practices seriously. It's that their rigorous, active spiritual practice was blinding them to the person in need of love right in front of them in their own synagogue. All of our spiritual formation at the end of the day is for the sake of others. It's meant to form us into people who are then freely offered as a gift of love to the world around us. And so here is the litmus test of all spiritual formation in the way of Jesus. Is it leading me deeper into community or deeper into isolation? Is it pulling me further into sacrificial mission or further into self-gratification? Is it leading me broader into seeing others or deeper into self-centered navel-gazing? So this is an introduction to a teaching series that's going to carry us all the way to Easter Sunday, Unforced Rhythms of Grace, Nine Core Practices for a Rule of Life. And in addition to hearing from me over the course of this teaching series, you'll hear from a number of different voices on our pastoral team, from our friend Tim Mackey of the Bible Project, and even by our founding pastor, old Jack Comer, is going to stop by, <laughs> pay us a visit. So we're going to look one by one at the nine essential practices that we see in the life of Jesus and the Gospels, which most concisely summarize his yoke. And then we're going to conclude with a rule of life, which is ancient terminology for a container for living out and holding these practices together in community. But if we're going to go on that journey, then you need to know from the very outset and you need to hold at the forefront of your imagination every step along the way that this teaching series on these nine practices, it's not about how you do the practices. It's about what the practices do to you. So I want to close by returning to where we started. That question that I've been turning over in my imagination for months now. How does practicing the way of Jesus actually make my burden light and my soul rested? I mean, what should I expect to experience? Is there some kind of telltale sign that it really is Jesus I'm following and it is his yoke that I've got draped over my back? How do I know if it's working? I think it's easier to see than explain, so I'll offer you this picture. It was the last night of summer vacation in late July on the Oregon coast. I was trying to squeeze every last drop out of that time away because I could feel it slipping through my fingers, and so I insisted that I was going to stay at the beach until the sun had fully set, and Hank, my oldest child, was the only member of my family willing to hang with me through the duration. And as he was boogie boarding in the ocean, I was scheming the best night of my life, which involved an extravagant dinner made up of several courses of exotic ingredients that the Safeway at the Oregon coast was definitely not going to carry. Uh, I'm planning to watch a movie afterwards and then hopefully finish up the novel that I'd been reading as I was turning in. And in the midst of my future pleasure-stacking daydream, the perfect execution of my own rest, so I thought, Hank runs in from boogie boarding, sits next to me, wraps up tightly in a towel, leans up against me to stay warm, and says, Dad, no one crushes summer vacation like you and me. (laughs) 
And then we were both just quiet. A moment ago, I was flooded with all kinds of plans in my head and longings in my gut, but now, with my seven-year-old son leaning against me, watching the sun get lower on the endless ocean horizon, I was flooded with a completely different feeling. The schemes for my own rest began to fall away, and I was instead content, happy, alive, grateful, satisfied. And there's a word for it, for what happened to me there. Joy. For the Pharisees, there was so much formation, but there was no joy. Jesus forms his disciples for joy. I can't actually remember what we had for dinner that night. I don't think we watched a movie. I always fall asleep in the middle of it when we do anyway. And I didn't finish that novel till several weeks after I had returned from vacation. None of my schemes came to be, but I will never forget that moment that I wasn't planning. Sitting on the sand with Hank leaning up against me, watching the sun fall low on the ocean horizon, I did not for a second think, but how do I apply this to my life? I just listened to the sound of the waves and I felt my little boy's heart beating against my arm and I looked in awe at the great artwork of the creator. I did not ask, how do I apply this to my life? I asked something like, how do I enjoy this? This presence of God that is bursting into my ordinary life all the time. How do I enjoy life and life to the full? Dallas Willard says, the aim and substance of spiritual life is not fasting, prayer, hymn singing, frugal living, and so forth. Rather, it is the effective and full enjoyment of active love of God and humankind in all the daily rounds of normal existence where we are placed. Richard Foster closes his classic, The Celebration of Discipline, which repopularized the idea of spiritual formation by practice when the church had fallen in love with whole life formation by nothing more than head knowledge. He concludes that book by calling joy the motor that keeps everything else in the spiritual life running. And in the midst of his most well-known teaching on the ongoing work of cultivating a salvation life from the inside out, Jesus concludes, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The most deeply formed disciples of Jesus should be the most content, alive, happy, hilariously joyful people in this world. Every year of your life, Walking the narrow way behind Jesus of Nazareth with his yoke draped over your back, you could find yourself more abounding and overflowing with joy. That's how you know it's working. Jesus called his yoke easy precisely because it is not a spiritual wellness plan. It's an invitation to bask in his constant presence and to feel the warmth of his glow on your face and to take it all in. Jesus is not trying to teach you new spiritual techniques. He's trying to help you recognize him in all the ways he's showing up in the ordinary life that you already have. He's trying to teach you to come to him in your early mornings and in the blur of your work days and on your lazy Saturdays. And to come to him when you're alone and when you're with others. To come to him when you're busy and when you're bored. To come to him when you're inspired and when you're frustrated and when you're disappointed and everything in between. Because if you know his heart, his gentle, humble heart, you want to come. And something amazing happens when we walk and we know his heart and when we walk with him day in and day out, effortlessly, almost accidentally, the rhythm of our hearts begins to match his, to beat for the same things at the same pace. We begin to gaze at others exactly as we see him gazing at us. In the words of Dane Ortland, only as we drink down the kindness of the heart of Christ will we leave in our wake everywhere we go the aroma of heaven and die one day having startled the world with glimpses of a divine kindness too great to be boxed in by what we deserve.